Mike Radich here, and I'm now joining the phone by performance coach John Walker. John, how are you? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. How about yourself? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for asking. Right now, John, you're working with a lot of top athletes in the world of MMA. You're working with fighters from both the UFC and from Bellator. I'm just curious, currently, how many fighters are you working with? Probably going to be somewhere around 20 to 25 uh, pro professional fighters. Um, actually, I'll say, uh, let's call them more like 15 professional and um, another 10 or so uh, pro amateur who are coming up. Uh, but just as talented as those guys that are competing at the highest level. I know you from your days at USC. I followed your football career for many years, but I'm just curious, when exactly did you start working with MMA athletes? And were you a fan of the sport before you started working with the fighters? You know what? I'm going to step out on a ledge and and say that uh, mixed martial arts is actually my favorite sport. Mm -hmm. Um, It always has been ever since I grasped the understanding of it and just kind of the concept of it. Back in the early 90s, I remember my my parents didn't really allow me to to watch that or or really support it. Um, But I've always had a passion for the art of, you know, one-on-one, man versus man at the time, uh, essentially mano a mano. There's just something very... um, very classic and very uh, almost heroic about about the types of efforts that you have to put forth mm-hmm. when uh, when you know that you're you're going to be essentially locked in a cage with 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 another person who who is almost fighting for their life. Um, that's always that's always been a very compelling um, kind of component of of the sport. Uh, I just uh, from a personal standpoint. You know, martial arts for me just wasn't very a uh, realistic opportunity uh, because football was what I excelled at, mm-hmm. and of course, obviously, it's my passion. Um, but MMA, uh, particularly um, Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, have just always been these kind of like essential components of my life growing up. When did you start training some of the fighters? When did that happen? Hmm. I want to say the first, my first real, real go around at it was probably in 2007 or so, 2007, 2006, when, uh, when I just started to kind of dibble and dabble into um, learning jiu-jitsu. Uh, and then I, I run into a couple of guys who, who just liked the way that I conditioned my football players and my other athletes that I was working with. And so they were like, hey, man, do you guys mind if, you know, if we join in on some of these ladder drills and, you know, pushing the sled, parachutes, et cetera, um, what I found was they, those athletes just had this really unique um, unique approach to, to, to punishing their body um, for the sake of personal growth and, and, and uh, I, I guess you'd say athletic development. And I really, really, it was, it was a type of energy and charisma that they brought to their training atmosphere that really, really allowed me to kind of sink my teeth into it. And I immediately wrapped my heartstrings around um, beginning to develop pro- programming to to teach those athletes to better use their, their attributes. Mm-hmm. Did you ever consider competing in the sport? Because I think of a guy like Brendan Schaub, who has a similar story to you. You know, he played in the NFL, he played in arena football, and, you know, you're, you're an athletic guy, you're still a young man. Did you ever consider fighting? Um, actually, I have. Very much so. I was I was training for my first fight um, in 2009, 2010, and I got hurt. I um I got really hurt actually. Not not even in training, but just post post workout. I uh, somehow I pinched my nerves in my lower back, and I was I was just walking. I don't know what happened, but it was, it was kind of one of those things that was like. Uh, Hey, maybe you know, maybe that's a sign that I need to slow down a little bit. Plus, I was, you know, I was still really training hard um, with with the hopes of, of making a comeback in, in football as well. I was just a year removed from um, participating in the Arena Football League, so you know, football was still a very uh, you know prevalent part of my life. Mm-hmm. And and, and in, in martial arts training was one of those kind of things that um, 
allowed me to cross train within my football conditioning. So I have I have had some some kind of I would call it underground fights. <laughs> right. Um, they, you know, more, they were more glorified uh, aggressive sparring sessions, mm-hmm. um, but it was full go. Um, you know, it was you know we had we had refs and officiating, and, and you know I, I did pretty well. I did pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've been around high-level athletes for a very long time. You know, you played at USC with a lot of high-level athletes. You played against a lot of high-level athletes when you were in college, and then when you went to the NFL, you played with and against a lot of high-level athletes. I'm just curious, how do the athletes in MMA compare to the other sports? Um, relative to relative to their the specific needs of their mm-hmm. of their sport, um, they compare. Um, Greatly, uh, for example, there's a certain and unique energy signal that most, let's just say, let's parallel it with football. The football players have to be anaerobic athletes um, with the ability to use isometric strength periodically, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a very similar in- energy signal to that of a mixed martial artist. Um, it's, it's a very anaerobic, uh, very uh, essentially up tempo, fast. Type of uh, energy that you have to produce to, to be successful at any at any moderate level of martial arts, or I feel any moderate level of competition. Um, but I, I say athlete for athlete, these these fighters uh, they have a unique and specific understanding of who they are, where their strengths lie, and how they can properly use their natural attributes within within kind of the game plan of their fight style. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really cool because each athlete brings a different, for me, a different set of skills to hone, a different set of skills to uh, develop, as well as different personalities. Um, and unlike football, you can't hide behind your face mask. Um, <laughs> you know, in MMA, you're completely exposed. You're, you are, you know, you're blood and guts vulnerable and the whole the whole world and the whole arena is watching um if you don't prepare you're going to get hurt you're not going to be successful in mma whereas i found that a lot of football players can kind of fake it from time to time um and i and i you know just speaking from personal experience uh at, at least at the high school level i'll say a lot of my teammates and fellow classmates, they, they didn't train or condition out mm-hmm. that well. They didn't work as hard as, as I believe we all could have worked collectively. But um, they still had some moderate level of success mm-hmm. because there were there were brothers who were there to, to kind of right. work them with the load and cover some of the flag. Plus, it worst come to worst, you know, they always had their, their face mask tied behind mm-hmm. if things weren't going that well. Mm-hmm. Um, but in MMA, you are just flat out on your face exposed <laughs> and I really really love the sincerity and the, um, the almost uh, you know for lack of a better term I'm going to say gladi- gladioric uh, feel of that right. you know as early as like the early Roman days it, it's always been um, kind of one of the most essential uh, athletic components of like the art of war man versus man gladiator versus gladiator uh, and then nowadays, you know, woman versus woman, and I think that that is amazing. I love it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it any better. You know, I've been saying similar stuff like that because, you know, there's been many times where maybe you had a bad game, but the team still won, or maybe you had the greatest game of your life, but the team lost. You really, in this sport, you there's a lot of things that you can't control because the unpredictability, and there's so many ways to win and lose, but in a roundabout way, you do control your own destiny because if, if you're not performing, then you're the only one who's suffering the consequences, and if, and if you're the one performing well, you're the one uh, getting all the all the glory. So now I'm just curious when an athlete comes to you from MMA uh, and they start training with you, what are they looking for? What are they looking to gain when they come to work with you? I think number one, um, mo- you know, most of the athletes are probably looking for, um, something different. Um, uh, you know, a level of rapport and authenticity in, in preparation that they can't find easily anywhere else. Um, the truth of the truth of the matter is, is I love my athletes. Um, I think the the single most essential component that I live by, my my 
our most dominating and driving life force is you know one of the you know one of the commandments uh, from the Bible, which is love my brother like I love myself, and I handle that type of approach with with each and every athlete that I'm blessed and fortunate enough to to foster a relationship with, and I think with that level of trust and rapport and and sincerity in in in, in terms of you know the approach of whatever whatever it is we're doing uh, to prepare them um as you as you develop that that connection that bond then those athletes are just they're they present themselves available to to bear their all i mean they you know they rip themselves wide open and you you know they're, they're no longer guarded or or shielded uh, or you know apprehensive to to expose themselves you know um and i think that's when you can when you can create that level of trust that's when you get down to the to the kind of bare bones of what makes that athlete tick as a performer and you know why they are intrinsically motivated to, to compete in this type of arena in this type of sport mm-hmm. and uh when they feel that they're for you man you, you know i really believe the sky's the limit mm-hmm. so initially uh, just to, to, to kind of get back on, <clears throat> on track with, with the initial question was, I think what they're looking for is a little something different. I, I think that they're they're tired of cookie cutter uh, workout formulas. Um, you know, they're tired of the you know knock against CrossFit, but you know they're tired of just the vanilla and kind of mundane approach to to performance or strength and conditioning. Um, I don't. I don't advertise myself as a strength and conditioning coach. Um, it is my. It is my belief that strength and conditioning is is in so many words. Um, and again, you no know, disrespect to to the term or to the coaches who classify themselves as strength and conditioning coaches. I just think that um, performance is the evolution of strength of S and C. Um, and what I mean by that is, I can. I have been very strong in my career. I have, you know, I've been a nearly 600-pound squatter when I was uh, 200 pounds of weight. I, you know, I've, I've I've done some pretty phenomenal things just from a from a strength point, and and my conditioning has always been one of one of the you know um, kind of guiding forces in my career. I've, I've never entered a season out of shape or deconditioned, but what I found was. Neither of those attributes, being strong nor being able to run forever, allowed me to perform better. None of it helped me play football better mm-hmm. or at greater, uh, you know, op- optimum um, results. I was just very strong, but it didn't translate always. I was very conditioned. I never got tired, but it didn't necessarily help me cover receivers or catch the football better. Right. So what I what I've done is essentially created a unique series of specific movements that have to be performed precisely in order to create a unique and physiological response within each and every athlete so that they are creating an adaptive change in who they are, how they think, and they can use those new abilities and attributes and directly correlate them with what they have to do inside and outside of the ring, the cage, the jiu-jitsu mat, the wrestling mat, the football field, the tennis court, the volleyball court, the swimming pool, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what makes us different is that we handle everything from an inner energy production standpoint. What energy signaling systems do you need to use to make yourself be uh, more optimal in this range of motion or how do we strengthen your mental fortitude so that you don't fatigue mentally and physiologically as quickly as you did before? Once you, you know, once you create and quantify those results for those athletes, then right away they understand, wow, this is something different. This is something unique. This is something next level. And I believe I have a competitive advantage over my opponent now. You've really fallen in love with the switchboard, haven't you? I have. I have. Um, I love anything that forces you to gain more body awareness, body control, and forces you to focus. Um, if you're on top of the switchboard, or the, the other tool I love to use is called a strong board, um, but the switchboard is actually a, it's, it's a motor operated, so it actually it travels. It, you know, it's, it's very much similar to a Segway uh, mm-hmm. without the handles. It kind of reminds me of like Back to the Future. 
feature, like Marty McFly and stuff, which is really cool. But, but you know, the cool thing about it is, is uh, if you have to use your core to stabilize, then that means you're enhancing your body's proprioceptic properties. That's your shock absorbers in your entire body are turned on. If you can live in a state of heightened proprioception, you're just going to be a greater athlete. You're going to respond and react better to any and everything. Um, so I'm huge on proprioception. Um, you know, making sure that from the ground up, from your feet all the way to the top of your head, that your body is in sync with your mind and you're always having the great lines of communication with mind to muscle. So any tool that, that helps me enhance that within my athletes, I'm going to be all over, like uh, like cheese on uh, <laughs> cheese on nachos. Now, is the switchboard is that your invention? Like, is that something that that you just brought in to your program, or is that something that you know the the company that makes those they advertise like, hey, you can use this with athletes, or is that you know your own brainchild? Well, no, I wish the Lord knows, I wish I could I could take credit for that marvelous invention, but um, no, what it was was I I actually I'm always on the hunt to look for these training tools that I believe can appropriately be integrated within my program. Uh, and as I as I look to create a new curriculum, I also look to create, you know, to find unique toys and, uh, and training tools that create excitement within my athletes as well. Um, because, you know, if, if, these, if these guys and, and, and girls can, can have fun while they're working, you're just going to get a better reaction from them. There's just always so much pressure with, with training, so I'm always looking for cool stuff. And when I saw, when I saw the, uh, the switchboard, I really saw it at the, the fitness expo. But that was taken in Los Angeles a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of got a hold of the, the guys who manufacture them, and I said, hey, you know, have you guys looked into this as a performance tool, or have you have you tried to infiltrate the fitness space with this? I know, it, you know, it's like more of a lifestyle kind of functional, fun, kind of, uh, kind of cool toy, if you will, but, you know, what type of uh, sports science do you have on it? Um, they, you know, I think that they like the concept, so they dropped off a couple to my, my facility, and they said, hey, if you can come up with some content and some curriculum and then maybe some sports facts that help support that, we may be able to have this thing infiltrate that unique fitness or sports performance space. So that, that's kind of where I am, just trying to see if, if there's legitimacy to that and, you know, uh, weigh out the pros and cons, risk versus rewards. Now, you're always on the hunt for trying to find you know something that you can add into your program, but the fighters, they're always on the hunt to get that advantage. You know, this sport is evolving right before our eyes. You know, we're still kind of in the leather helmet days, but the sport has evolved very quickly. You know, in the big picture, it's a very young sport, but we keep evolving and, and things keep getting better training-wise and, and skill-wise and all that. I'm just curious, some of the athletes that come to work with you, is that the first time they're ever being exposed to a, to a, a proper workout program? You know, as much as I hate to admit this, yes. You know, um, most most of the athletes that I have had a chance to work with um, did not have any formalized uh, or systematized way to condition themselves beyond that of just whatever they were doing for fight training or fight preparation. Because, to be honest, there's just so many elements. And these, these athletes, mixed martial artists, no one understands who, who, who's not really kind of intimately involved in the sport the level of sacrifice and commitment these athletes have and how focused and controlled they have to be each and every day. For example, in the standard mixed martial artist has to have a boxing coach, a, probably a wrestling coach, or some form of grappling coach, be it, you know, grapple roaming, judo, jiu-jitsu, uh, aikido, etc. right? Mm-hmm. Um, they, they have to have a mixed martial arts coach who teaches them the martial, the MMA game, and how to transition and how to move well. They, <laughs> they have to have uh, sparring partners and, and you know, kickboxing, Muay Thai, whatever their striking form is, there's, a, there's already five, six, maybe seven coaches that they're 
traveling to, and most times these coaches are not centrally located. They have to, mm-hmm. they have to travel to get get you know and develop these little relationships all all throughout their regions, especially if they're trying to work with with elite level competitors and elite level coaches. And I didn't even mention performance coach or strength and conditioning coaches. You know, so the, their resources are spread thin. Their funds are oftentimes you know widely distributed out just to get that extra little development or enhancement. So, you know, it's unfortunate that usually the performance or the strength side of it has to be sacrificed because there's only so much they can do. If they're training three times a day, one wrestling workout, one boxing, one Brazilian jiu-jitsu, or one kickboxing, you know, where do they fit in the performance? Where do they fit in the extra? So I understand why they don't have... Too, many, too much experience with working with a coach like myself. It's like, there's no time. There's no time, there's no resources, and then, you know, there's no coach that they trust well enough with their body who can work well within the scheme of the other coaches and what they're being taught. So there has to be, a, again, a great level of rapport and trust where the performance or the strength, strength and conditioning coach complements what they do with their skills coach, right? Right. And that's usually a tough, it's a tough thing to do. Mm-hmm. Do you mostly work one-on-one with these athletes or do you have groups? You know what, it varies. Um, it varies. And, you know, the closer they get to fights, I, I begin to kind of uh, really uh, hone in on what their unique and specific needs are. Uh, but I will say it varies. And most times they don't like to work one-on-one. Um to be honest, there you know it's already a kind of an individualized sport to a certain extent. But um, most of these people love their their training partners and their friends mm-hmm. who can uh, kind of help support them through mm-hmm. through the tough the tough training. Yeah, because it's not easy. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. You don't you don't want me beating you up for an hour and a half, two hours <laughs> by yourself every day. I, I promise you, they're they're hoping that they can get. You know, get some motivation and support by by some similar individuals. Now, what is your role when a fighter is going through training camp? Because I often see you cornering guys. I see you in the corner. What's your role? And on fight night, are you giving any sort of advice, or are you just there more for support? Oh no, absolutely. I'm there from start to finish um, because I'm, not only am I a strength and conditioning coach, but I'm also a participating athlete. Mm-hmm. I'm still very much conditioned and in shape, and and I go to jujitsu practice. I, I go to you know I don't wrestle as much as I should. That is definitely the hole in my game. <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a pretty stand up striker. You know I've been strike training since 2003 at USC, um, and so I, I you know I feel very comfortable on my feet, and I'm a sparring partner to most of my most of my athletes who are who are male, and. Um, and so they trust, and we, you know, they trust that I can also, because of my athleticism, what I do is I mimic the movement patterns, and I try my best to mimic the tendencies of our upcoming opponent, so that they're getting a good vibe on how that person moves as best as I can kind of articulate that with my body, right? Right. Um, so, so, you know... And that's not with every single fighter, so, you know, because most times we only get three corners unless I think it's a title fight or a main event. Sometimes the UFC may allow uh, a fourth cornerman, um, and that's just the UFC. I don't even know if Bellator does that now. Oh, actually, I think they do. Please forgive me. I think Bellator does. Maybe that's standard across the charts with MMA. But um, so you only get three, and like I said, in, you know, most times they're taking a wrestling coach or some type of grappling coach, a striking coach, and then an MMA coach, who is the strategist that puts the whole thing together for them. I've, I've rarely ever seen a strength and conditioning or a performance coach be a good corner of athlete. It's kind of one of those things that is the lost, you know, we're the, we're the lost kind of guy in the background, you know. <laughs> you may see it in a picture periodically, but, but um, you know, it's never been a point of emphasis to, to have – that 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 individual be there throughout the fight prep journey, um, at least you know in terms of fight week. But for me, I stretch my athletes, I recover them, I help them stay hydrated, and, and make sure that our weight is on point. 
I, I rehydrate them post weigh-ins and make sure that they're getting the amount of rest that they need throughout the week. And, and you know, you know, I consider myself more of a spiritual leader. So, you know, it's, it, the goal is, is to make sure that they're all mentally and physically sound. They feel well. Their belief is high. You know, they're not allowing the media obligations to distract them too much. Mm-hmm. And then also that we're very regimented and we're training throughout that week um, in, in preparation of that fight so that we can properly periodize that moment and peak right when we're supposed to. You know, I want to make sure that you are at the highest possible competitive level um, mentally, spiritually, physically um, when the bell rings and the door, the cage door gets closed. Right. Mm-hmm. So it has been a huge honor and a huge blessing for the, the level of these competitors to actually invite me in, not only to just work with them uh, from their conditioning and performance standpoint, but also be there in the most intimate and sacred times of their of the of the whole process. So this has been new because I've trained a lot of guys that have never asked me to corner them, but just recently, over the last uh, two years, I've been. Uh, heavily involved with corner, involved rather, with cornering the athletes, and um, I'm, I'm getting that perspective, and it's a beautiful thing. It, it really is. Mm-hmm. Is it fair to say of the athletes that you work with, you're closest with Tony Ferguson and Uriah Hall? Um, you know, I would I would, I would want to say that, but um, I don't know if that's fair to say to all of the other athletes because I feel like I'm equally as close. Um, but there are just certain there are just certain bonds that kind of transcend coach athlete. You know those those guys are, are family uh, to me, and um, so there is there is a certain uniqueness. You know, but I can go on and on and on about the guys and and, and the ladies that I'm training that I I sure will, will really kind of step in and argue the contrary. <laughs> you know that we're that we're closer, um, but it's just a testament to. Um, hopefully, the, again, that level of trust and rapport that I said that we work to create. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't, I'm not going to credit it to myself. It has nothing to do with me. I don't think, I believe it's just a part of the process mm-hmm. that those athletes trust in. And if, if I can play any small part or small role in helping them uh, accomplish their dreams or bring their goals to fruition, then, my friend, I have done my job not only as a coach but as a brother, as family, um, and just my duty in life, uh, you know, to help others reach those levels of su- success. That's the very least I can do to pay this life back for allowing me to be here. Mm-hmm. And, and that is how I operate. It's how my heart works. Um, of course, it's made me vulnerable in many situations, and I've been crushed by athletes who um, who maybe didn't understand kind of how I'm wired or how I tick. But for the ones who get it, for example, like Tony and, and Uriah, and, and, you know, I'm working with Ashley Evans Smith and, uh, and Jonathan Santa Maria who fights for Bellator mm-hmm. and, and then Kendall Grove, you know these are these are and Kelvin Gastelum. These are guys that I just love, and and these are you know ladies that we're we're family, man. And uh, and I just, I'm gonna fight for them. I'm gonna fight for them till I have no breath in me. How many other athletes from other sports do you work with currently? I would say over, off and on uh, from NCAA. Uh, amateur and pro amateur it's off and on seasonally as well over 100 to 200 mm. um, it's just a matter of seasons um, and, and, and just so you guys understand one of the reasons I've also focused a lot of my career on mixed martial arts is because my, my second gym that I opened was an MMA facility right, right. Um, because I loved it that much uh, you know I, I first actually started MMA training in 2003 at USC. Um, I met a coach, and he was <laughs> he was the man. Oh, this this guy used to toss myself, and, and I had a teammate named Jason Leach. Mm-hmm. Boy, he used to beat us up so bad. But he was the guy that first kind of whet my appetite to it. And when I knew that I had a unique passion for it, I knew that that was something I wanted to do. So, uh, you know, as soon as I was in the NFL, and I had a, you know a little bit of established 
you know, my finances were pretty secure. Uh, yeah, I went out and opened up a facility in, in uh, Long Beach, California. Uh, it was right next door to a Marshall uh, MMA gym, and and I kind of partnered up with those guys, and we've been we've been family and friends since. But that was kind of how I essentially became immersed in it. Um, and so it was just a very natural kind of progression to, to keep you know keep going into sports. Um, and I, I think it just it, it just leads to the fact that uh, you know it's just a game. It's a game that doesn't have an off season, mm-hmm. right? right? MMA is so unique that there's no downtime ever. The fighters are constantly in circulation. They're constantly in need of of training and coaching. They live in a state of condition, and they live trained. It's not like they have an off season. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, there's times when they're they're not they're not active, but usually they're still working their craft because this is one game that does not stop progressing. Like mm-hmm. you said, it's right. constantly evolving, and those athletes, if they stand still, they're essentially getting left behind. So. Mm-hmm. They have to keep moving, and, and that's what I really, I'm drawn to the fact that it's an ever-evolving sport with ever-evolving athletes and needs for those athletes. So I've managed to kind of, you know, really infiltrate a, a space and and, a, and provide a supply for an area that's really in high demand. And there's always short-notice fights. You never know when that phone call is coming, so you always got to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. It's correct. Just curious, what's been your key to success? Because wherever you've gone, you know, you've, you've had other gyms before. Where you're currently working is not your first go-around uh, in this industry. And wherever you've gone, you've had success. You've had results. You know, you've been able to do it uh, at a high level and, and, you know, get your athletes to where you want to get them. You know guys, and I know guys, and people listening know guys who, you know, played in the NFL, played Major League Baseball, played in the NBA, and when their career's over, they want to transition into your industry, but for whatever reason, they don't find success. You know, maybe it's because, you know, maybe they're a great athlete and they're a great player, but for whatever reason, they can't translate their knowledge and and get it into someone else. They can't teach someone or they're just not a good businessman and that's why they fall apart. I'm just curious, why have you been able to succeed where so many other guys, great athletes, great players, but have failed? What's your key to success? Well, um, thank you for saying that. That, that, that. First of all, that means a great deal. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, and I, you know what? Honestly, I'm gonna I'm just gonna put it all out there on the table. It has nothing to do with me, man. It's mm-hmm. because I serve an awesome God who has granted me so much favor in my life, and He's protected me and kept me safe. Um, and you know, He's given me He's given me a mind that can process thoughts cognitively. He's given me abilities with my body to where the, I can move well and, 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 you know, demonstrate exercises and techniques that force these athletes to see where they can progress to if they're not there. And also that legitimizes, wow, that dude can move like that at his size and his speed. He can do that and he trains himself, okay, maybe I can aspire towards that. So it, it gives me, I'm a living testimony of my training program and my module. And, and in my program, I'm very demonstrative. I demonstrate everything for my athletes. And then I articulate it well. Um, and that's all based on being blessed enough to go to USC and study communications there. And, and, and so I just think I'm a unique and direct product of all the wonderful coaches that I've had all the way from high school through Coach Pete Carroll and some of my mentors with Nike, with Rick, Rick Hagedorn, with Nike Speed Burners. Um, I've just had wonderful people in my life to, you know, to mentor me, um, to say, hey, kid, you've got a unique thing about you here, continue to cultivate that, and then don't lead with your ego, lead with your, lead with your heart. And, um, and the truth is, I only coach my athletes the way that I wish that I was coached my entire career. And I legitimately, um, I legitimately believe that if I, if I just put my heart into everything that I do, that you know, God is always going to honor my steps. And if I plant good seeds everywhere I go and stay positive and try to encourage people along their path, 
and that those seeds will eventually bear good fruit. So everywhere I go, there's good fruit. There's there's never there's never you know something negative happening because I just don't lead with that with that type of energy. And and um, I want I love man. I want you to do well. I want to do well. And I think that there's enough out here for all of us to be to be happy and do well together. <laughs> So, you know, honestly, it's, it's a, I'm a product of my upbringing. My parents definitely raised me to, to uh, you know, be a loving kid, you know, and, and, and not to be very com- confrontational or, or combative. Although it happens, you know, I'll go, you know, it's essentially walk small but carry a big stick. And, um, you know, I can't say that it's any specific thing that I do. I think it's just to be, honestly, the grace of God and then allowing his love to shine through me and those the athletes that I work with, they see it, man, and and then I'm consistent. You know, I'm not saying one thing and then doing another. You know, they don't see me saying, I, you know, I'm telling them that, you know, stay away from these things. They're bad for your body. They're bad for you. And then I go around and I'm doing those things, right? And they, they look up to me, you know, and, and so it's cool. Even though the older, the older athletes I coach, in some sense or, or fashion, I feel like they all look up to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that means a lot. Let's change gears a little bit because I really want to talk about your football career because during that era that you were at USC, I'll admit it, I was a Fairweather fan. You know, I jumped on the bandwagon like everyone else. I'll admit that. But yeah, but I loved, I loved that team. You know, all those guys that that era, the four Pac-10 championships, uh, two national championships. I loved that team. You know, Matt Liner, Reggie Bush, Lendale White, Mike Williams, Kerry Colbert, Steve Smith, Dwayne Jarrett. Dominic yeah. Bird, Deuce Latui, Winston Justice, Ryan Khalil, Fred Matua, Cedric Ellis, Sean Cody, Frosty Rucker, Lofa Tatupu, Matt Grudegood, uh, Dallas Sartz, Darnell Bing, Jason Leach, Justin Wyatt, you know, all those guys. I loved all those guys. And that doesn't even mention the guys who were who were there before then, you know, like Carson Palmer and Troy Palomalu and Justin Fargus, you know, those guys. You know, I really loved that team. So I'm really, really curious to know. Because there was that massive win streak and you're winning national championships and all this stuff. What was it like being a USC football player during that period? Okay, that is a great question. I'm going to tell you what it was. It was it was more taxing and more demanding than being an NFL football player, mm-hmm. by far. Um, we were, in my opinion the professional football team in Los Angeles. Right. Um, and and that was, it took a great deal of composure and competitive aggression on a daily basis. Each and every day you woke up, well, speaking for me, each and every day I woke up, I woke up with a zeal and a, a luster to accomplish something that I hadn't done before. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and the thing is, is that the energy that we, that Coach Carroll and, and our staff was able to kind of manifest in us was he made all of us as young men, as young kids, I'm going to say, he transformed us into men within two, three months. We all adopted and understood, uh, you know, the, the, the killer mentality that was needed to compete at the highest athletic level um, on the largest stage with all of the media with all of the obligations not to mention the academic workload of a private university at the University of Southern California no one understands legitimately unless you live through it how demanding that entire tenure was no one it was equally as fun as it was rewarding but it was also extremely, extremely exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly for someone like myself, I carried 22 units my entire career. And it was even so much so that I had an academic violation because I, um, I, fell, I fell under units because of my, my uh, workload was so hard. I think I missed my first spring ball in college because of that. And just, I was like, gosh, this is not easy. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, school is hard here. Like, mm-hmm. the education system is very hard. And and there were, uh, like, average, what, 23, 24 students in, in an average classroom as opposed to some of the larger 
larger universities where it'd be 300, 400 students in an auditorium, and the teachers, the professors are just kind of, they're doing their thing. But at SC, the, the, the professors roam around the room, and they check on you, and they interact with you, and it gave you a really, like, kind of, like, you couldn't cheat or hide behind um, anything. You had to be there. You had to be available. And when I say when I say cheat, I don't mean cheat on, on your academics. I mean you can cheat the process. Mm -hmm. You can cheat yourself because they held you accountable. Um, you couldn't miss class and then be okay. You had to be in class and then you had to be out of practice and then you had to compete against some of the best players in football just to get a job. Mm -hmm. Just to get just to get a look. <laughs> right. Um, so that was that was kind of it, man. But it, it made us stronger men. Um, that that process in college prepared me for the man that I am today. And I would never, never be able to thank Coach Pete Carroll enough ever in my life. Um, when I was in college, it took me all the way to my senior year to become a starter. Mm -hmm. That was years and years of heartache and crying and feeling prepared and and feeling like, why isn't it happening for me? I execute in practice. I'm doing well. You know, I don't make bad mistakes on the field. I'm, 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 I'm a great locker room guy. My grades are great. I'm, I'm a dean's list honorable mention athlete. I got 3.7 grade point average. I'm doing everything that I can and am supposed to do to be right, including conditioning, training, and, and you know, being a great uh, teammate and recruit recruit guys for all the young incoming mm -hmm. uh, athletes that we were recruiting. So I was doing my part, and I'm like, okay, why aren't I reaping the fruits of this labor? You know what? It taught me perseverance. It taught me persistence. It, it taught me patience. It taught me understanding, and it taught me fortitude and stick to -itiveness. Those are things that I think are lacking in this generation's uh, mentality. I think these kids these days want everything now, and if it doesn't happen, they pout or they try to find the shortcut. Whereas for me and Coach Carroll, is saying, Jay Walk, I will cut you loose when you're ready, buddy. Mm -hmm. I promise. And I, and I didn't understand. And then finally, when he let me go, he said, it's time. He called me the night before that Hawaii game my senior year. Mm -hmm. Um I want to say he, uh, no, forgive me, he didn't call me. He told me he wanted to talk to me the next morning. And so we had a walkthrough. And as we were leaving the field, he pulled me aside and he said, Jay Walk, hey, buddy. He said, how you feeling? I said, I feel great, coach. I'm ready. He said, no kidding, you're ready. He said, everything that you've ever wanted, young man, mm -hmm. the time is now. Right. This is your time. He said, I want you to go out there, express yourself, and have fun and show them everything that you've been working on. Mm -hmm. Show them, mm -hmm. and I believe in you. Now you just go have fun and believe in yourself. Trust your teammates and play Trojan football. Mm -hmm. And man, I just remember having just the most, the greatest sigh of relief. You know, I felt like it was all worth it. The, you know, the juice was worth the squeeze. Right. And um, man, oh man, I will never, never be able to thank Coach Carroll enough for right. for just helping me gain those attributes at that at that young age. You know, at 20, 21 years old, I learned how to be a man right then and there. And what an opportunity. Your first start is against Hawaii. That's like a DB's dream because they pass all the time. So awesome. Yeah, so yeah. awesome. Just curious, when you think back to that time in your life, what are some of your favorite memories? Um, first and foremost, my favorite memory of all time um, at USC, oh man, <laughs> that's such a, that's a good one. The one that's popping into my head at this very moment okay. is uh, hoisting up the national championship trophy uh, after we beat Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. That was huge. Um, and that was, I think, Adrian Peterson's rookie year. Right. Uh, at OU, I believe. Mm -hmm. That was, that was, that's one of, that's one of the most, you know, beaming moments. And I kissed that crystal ball. Um, I remember, you know, another one was seeing Reggie Bush, um, his very first time, um, busting a 50 yard run. I want to say it was possibly against, uh, it wasn't even a 50 
Young Run. It was like a little shovel, like kind of like shovel pad where uh, the liner beat it right across the middle, and Reggie, uh, it was against Washington, and he split the field, split the defense, hurdled the guy, and he was gone. And I said, that is different. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. That, that kid right there is different. And I think it was after we had just lost the cow, if, okay. I, if I remember correctly, in double overtime. Okay. I think it was that. And then Reggie, boom, he takes out. That was the beginning of our winning streak. Okay. Okay. So, oh four. I really think it was UW, and we were playing at UW, okay. but I could be wrong. Please okay. forgive me. Um, okay. You know, those, those were a long time ago, those games over now. 11 years ago, but I want to say it was a, like Reggie ran kind of like a little, like a, a shake route, we called it, where he shakes out, cuts in, Matt threw it right over the center's head, boom, right in the middle, and Reggie turned straight up the field, put the dude, and was gone. You brought up the Oklahoma game, and I wanted to, I actually want to ask you about three games, and that's one of the three games I wanted to ask you about. 55-19, to 19. the game was billed as, you know, the game of the year because you have two Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks going against each other. You have, at Oklahoma, you have Jason White, and at SC, you have Matt Leinert, and it was a complete blowout. You know, Matt Leinert was on fire. He had five touchdowns. I think Steve Smith caught three touchdown passes. I'm just curious, going into that game, when you looked at the matchup, did you guys think that you had a good opportunity to run them out of South Florida, or did you think it was going to be, you know, the game of the century? Okay. To be to be honest, we we thought we were going to destroy them be, by more than that. Okay. Um, and and it was it wasn't even so much. Um, it was the matchups. It was it was we had we had a tight end that was unstoppable, mm-hmm. and although they had great secondary guys, we schemed them. Um, and at the time, I was playing wide receiver and defensive back that year. So I knew both game plans, offensively and defensively. And I knew that our offense was going to be untouched that game. Um, and one of their touchdowns was on a kickoff return, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I, I, if I believe correctly, they took the opening kickoff to the house, if I, if I, am, if I remember correctly. I think their yeah. first touchdown, they took a they took a kickoff to the house, right? Or went to the house, and Coach Carroll looked at us. He smirked <laughs> and he said, "Hey boys, we're in a football game." He said, "He said you can't give them too many freebies because they can't earn it on their own." Something to that effect, if I remember correctly. But boy, we we won, and, and we like that that means nothing. And then we went out there and and kind of they began to unravel when we punted. Their guy must have, well, he picked it up, but he must it. And uh, I want to say Colin Ashton recovered it, or someone recovered it on the sideline. Then we went on to score. And Dominic Bird, I think, had a crazy one-handed catch in the back of the end zone, something phenomenal looking. And um, and that was that. We, we knew we were going to route those dudes as long as um, we made tackles and we didn't, we didn't get caught up emotionally into the trash talk because they, they were they were doing a lot of jaw-jacking. Um, and uh, we, as long as we knew we didn't make penalties, we were going to do well. Mm-hmm. The second game I wanted to ask you about was in the 2005 season. You were in South Bend against number nine Notre Dame. Notre Dame had kind of had a resurgence. You know, Charlie Weiss had taken over for Tyrone Willingham, and he was you know getting them back into it. And they had a lot of great players. You know, Brady Quinn, uh, Darius Walker, Jeff Samarja, Anthony Vasano, a guy you're very familiar with, uh, Maurice Stovall. And uh, Tom Zibikowski, really good team, very good matchup. On the road in South Bend, massive win streak on the line. What do you remember about that game? Um, I remember not being able to remember that game until right. after I watched the film. <laughs> right. Um, that game, I had 103.4 fever, and I had food poisoning from Thursday, uh, the flight there, all the way up until after the game. Um, so that game was one of the, the, that was kind of, for me, um, the game where I felt like I, you know, I pulled on my big boy pants. Um, you know, Coach Carroll, Coach Carroll that game, I remember he told the equipment staff to put a visor over my face, my mm-hmm. face mask. Uh, it was a tainted visor at that because he said my eyes looked so weak and sick and, uh, he didn't want the other guys knowing how, mm-hmm. how bad, bad I felt. Um, and we only had, at that time, we lost Terrell Thomas to an ACL, and he was so, he turned out to be a great football player, obviously. Right. Um, but he was he was a sophomore, I think, and he was out for the season. And our backup 
ones were Carrie Harris and Kevin Thomas, and they were they were young. They were uh, freshmen. They I don't think they were ready for that that South Bay. Um, so there were no there was no depth. I had to I had to play. Um, and that game was uh, I actually just had a conversation about this game yesterday. Believe it or not, um, that game it epitomized what every college football fan wanted to see. Um, that's the game you dream of, especially with with the story and traditional rivalry as 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 dense and enriched as the one uh, across country between you know the Fighting Irish and you know the men of Troy. Mm-hmm. It was. You know, I think it was one of the greatest games of all time, just because right. it had the build up. I mean, I think we were still number one in the in the, in the country, and I think they were nine right. at the time. And uh, it was funny because earlier in that week, uh, I want to say Tom Zubikowski put in a uh, in a paper, you know, the week before, because I think they had a bye before us, um, if I'm correct, I believe so. Um, but they said, man, we just want to, we, we hope USC wins this game. Um, and I don't know, maybe we played ASU. I can't remember who we played, but we had a tough game. But they said, we want them undefeated. I hope that we get a, a USC undefeated. Mm-hmm. And I, that motivated me so much. I was like, oh, man, you want us undefeated? <laughs> okay, man, but you're going to get us undefeated. Um and so it did have to build up. You know, they came out with their with their green uniforms right. on. Right. They had uh, the grass. I remember pulling out several blades of grass that were over six six inches long, and uh, there were spots on the field that were just like complete swampy and, and like a mud pit. That you know the, the field was a little watery and waterlogged. And I'm like, gosh, what else could these guys try to do to to try to control some of our tempo and our mm-hmm. speed? And you know what? Believe it or not. It factored in, man. <laughs> right. We right. didn't have we didn't have extra long cleats, but we, we didn't. We just came with what we traditionally wear. But those guys had it seemed like they had longer studs in their cleats to grip the turf better. Um, so it took every bit of our, all of our athleticism and composure, and, and then the ball bounced our way a few times for us to, to pull that game off. You know. But with that being said, we knew. Uh, that we weren't going to lose. Um, I, I, I guarantee you, we felt like no matter how it looked, because I think we finished the half down that we were leading, and then they they had a really long a really long drive, and then they they scored on us to to. Uh, and then I think uh, you know Zivakowski took a punt return home, mm-hmm. something like just guys were just making plays left and right, and then they took the lead. They had momentum going into the halftime. And uh, Coach Carroll just was like, man, we, we came down here for a dog fight. You know, what did you expect? Mm-hmm. You know, when did you expect them to just, you know, lay over, roll over? You know, right. they got a new coach. They got a young running back who's doing really well. And they have, uh, at the time, Brady Quinn was an emerging and um, Heisman hopeful guy that they were talking about. And mm-hmm. they had Justin Marge, who was literally, uh, I thought at the time was top three receiver in the country next to my own teammates, Dwayne Jarrett and Steve Smith. Right. And then, and then Maurice Stolwall, who was like, gave me a nightmare that game. Right. Um, with his size and athleticism. You know, I, I had two really ridiculous pass interference calls that game, just dealing with his size and his ability to go up and attack the ball. So it had all the makings that, you know, of a real epic battle. Mm-hmm. And the final three minutes of that game possibly the best ever. They went 90 yards and, and scored. Brady Quinn took it in on a quarterback keeper. And, you know, it looked like, you know, that was their final drive. Like, you know, this is, okay, well, we're going to win the game now because we made the play at the end. And then SC gets the ball back, and the, the, the first play is an incomplete pass. The second play, Trevor Laws gets a sack. And so now it's uh, third and 20, and they throw a pass to Reggie Bush, which get, gets it to fourth and nine. And Matt Leinart makes one of the greatest throws in the history of college football. The only place that he could put the ball, he puts it. And Dwayne Jarrett, I don't remember who he beat, but has to make a touchdown-saving tackle. Then, when you get the ball into the red zone, I think it's like, uh, you know, under 10 seconds left, Matt Leinart tries to run it in, and he gets blasted at, like, the one 
and the ball comes out, and that and that stops the clock. So Notre Dame rushes the field, and they think they've won because the clock runs out, and then they have to put the time back on, and then the famous uh, Bush push comes into play because he was stuffed, and or Matt Liner was he tried to get it in on a quarterback sneak. He was stuffed initially, and then he gets a little bit of a push from Reggie Bush, and then he goes in, and, and you guys win the game. What do you remember about that final drive? Okay, so here's what I thought. Okay, wow. When we got sacked, yeah, everybody was holding hands on the sideline. Um, but I can remember also Coach Carroll telling us, um, it may have been Coach Carroll, or it could have been our offensive coordinator maybe at one of the team meetings. I just can't remember fully, but please forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, okay. But essentially, we were, we were, we were led to, to know that whoever had the ball last, if it was a close game, was going to win that game. Mm-hmm. And if we had the ball last, it was our game to win. Mm-hmm. And so we believe that, and we we trusted the process because just earlier that year, you know, we came back from an amazing deficit against Arizona State um, down, I don't know, it was like 3-17 to 17 or something ridiculous at halftime, and we came back to beat those guys like 24, 27 to 24 or something crazy like that, 28 to 24. But so we had experience in struggling to succeed. Right, we we already had enough repetition in in feeling what it felt like to number one get a punt returned back to us, which Zivakowski did in that game. Mm-hmm. So, and in most times, those type of momentum swings with a young team like we had tear you up. You know, those rookies like Ray Maluma and Brian Carson, um our young corners, our young secondary. We had, you know, the teams were, were still pretty young. You know, we we had reps at seeing what it felt like to to get beat in an area where we thought we were untouchable because of, of we were prepared, right? Um, Richardson from Arizona State took a punt return back to the house against us. So that I think that left us unscathed when Zimikowski did it. We we're like, okay, this has happened before. It doesn't mean that it's over. We just keep we keep fighting, right? We believe, mm-hmm. we trust the process. And so when 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 Matt got sacked, the only thing we could do was trust the process. Mm-hmm. We still have the ball. We still have two more downs, and all we need to do is get a first. We don't have to score on every play. We just got to keep the chains moving because we have threats all across this field who can put it in put it in the end zone at any moment. Right. We all knew after Reggie got that first, or rather he picked up that big chunk right. of yards, right. I, I knew something good was going to happen because I, as I looked in the Notre Dame fans, they were like biting their nails, they were praying, they were, everybody was like, and I saw, it felt like they didn't trust the system, they didn't trust their process, mm-hmm. and I knew that we were going to have some success there because I, I felt like it was our destiny. I felt like it was inevitable. We were, we, you know, personally, I thought we were going to go undefeated again that whole season. Um, the perfect check when 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 Matt looked out there, the corner stepped up to jam DJ. Initially, that was supposed to be a slant and go route, mm-hmm. but we we have three audibles from that type of technique. If that was, if that DB plays up close like that, it turns into either a deep fade or a back shoulder fade. Mm-hmm. If they're in cover two or some type of help over top, it's an underthrown fade. Back shoulder and Dwayne had practiced that and killed me in it. Killed me in practice with that route a hundred thousand times. Um, it was the most undefendable route that we had. Um, Especially with DJ, right? He just had an uncanny ability to control his body. His hands were baby soft, like you know, like Charmin with like magnets in them. And um, and Matt Liner and him had uh, you know they just have chemistry. Mm-hmm. So it, it was just kind of one of those things. Now the bonus was not the catch. The bonus was the yak. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. That was that was the game. And DJ fighting hard to get that extra yards, breaking a tackle, making a dude miss, and fighting to get those, what, I don't know, 40, maybe something yards. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where, to me, I felt like it was it was ours. Right, right. That was just one of the best throws ever. You know, that guy, I, I can't remember who was covering him on Notre Dame, but he had, he had great coverage. And Liner just puts it, the only place that, that it can go, he puts it there. 
And like you mentioned, the, the yards after the catch is what uh, made the biggest difference. But just one of the best drives in the history of college football. Just a, a great drive. Now, um, the last game that I wanted to talk to you about, the 2006 Rose Bowl. You're going for the three-peat. You're a senior on that team, so obviously the last game that you're going to play in college, you want to win. I'm just curious, does that game, does that still sting? Is, is it still, is it painful to talk about even to this day? It feels like every time that game comes on, it feels like breaking a finger all over again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that game, that game is, is still the most painful game to watch. Um, I didn't actually ever finish watching the full game until probably until 2010, maybe. Mm. To be honest with you, I've never watched that full game, game the, the second countdown, um, just because it does sting. And then when you watch the when you watch the game and you think about all the things we left on the field that day. Um, it was a kind of uncharacteristic of us um, not to execute when we when we knew we could. And then there was a, there was a couple of funny things going on uh, from my from my vantage point with some of the some of the not not the officiating but the lack of officiating. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> um, you know those those dudes down there in the trenches. They spent the entire game velcro to our defensive line. They were holding our defensive line the entire game and not one call. It was it was it was really, really kind of one of those remarkable games where the rest decided to just let guys do whatever they wanted to do. But the problem was is that we were we were trained to play within the integrity of the rules. So our interior uh, defensive linemen were like, man, like they're not calling anything. Mm-hmm. And so I guess you know st- structurally there needed to be some uh, some adjustments made. And I think is what enticed Frosty Rucker to even poke his head on the inside when Vince Young bounced out. Mm-hmm. He was he was getting so tired of being held that he he, he just he tried to he had to beat it before they held him, mm-hmm. and uh, because the rest weren't calling anything. And then, you know, the random, you know, Vince Young's knee touched the ground, yeah. and then he, he laddles the ball, and the running back goes on to score. Mm-hmm. Um, one ref actually pointed down that the ball was down, and then, right. and then the very same ref continues to try the play and then put his hands up like touchdown. Right. And when we went to review, the, the replay booth was mysteriously broken. Right. But there right. was a couple of things where you just go, man, the ball just didn't bounce our way that game. Right. And so you go. You got to ask yourself. Well, maybe it was their destiny, mm-hmm. you know, for this time. The two things that I remember a lot about that game are. Number one is that like every play was under review. There was like fifty reviews in that game. It seemed like every play was challenged or had to be you know had to have a second look taken at it. And then the second one was on both sides. The best players on either team were making the biggest plays or the most impactful plays. You know whether it's Leinart and Bush or on their team Vince Young and David Thomas and Michael Huff, guys like that. They're making all these big plays. But I'm just curious. Has Pete Carroll figured out who Reggie Bush was trying to lateral the ball to? Does he know who that guy was, or is that still a mystery? Oh, Brad Walker. <laughs> Brad Walker was uh, he was a walk-on wide receiver who was very skilled, but that guy would have never ever expected to get the ball. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. And now, you know, now Brad, uh, Big Walk, he was trying his best to, to protect Reggie. Right. That, you know, that was his job was to make sure Reggie didn't. You know, didn't get hurt, or you know, he he had to secure his block. But Reggie, for whatever reason, instinctively just wanted to get more out of that, and he laddled the ball back. And to be honest, Reggie was a little disconnected for the rest of the game. Mm. Um, you know, he was apologetic on the sideline. You know, it seemed like it seemed like he was just a little shaken. Not not uh, not to the point where it truly hindered his performance, but you 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 just know where he just wishes he could get that one back. Mm. You know. Um, but I think what happened was we stopped them on that drive right. when they got the ball back. Right. So it, it felt like uh, it was just okay to evened out. But, you know, by the the count, he's like, yeah, but it took points off the board for us, mm-hmm. which we probably would have won. Right. 
One of the big controversies after that game was the fact that USC went for it on fourth down and gave the ball to Lendell White. There were a lot of people who weren't so much questioning why did Pete Carroll give Texas a short field, which should have been the the controversy, but people were saying that they should have gave the ball to Reggie Bush in that situation. You know, he's the Heisman Trophy winner, and they should have went with him. But I thought that was the most ridiculous argument ever because Lendell White had the hot hand. They couldn't stop right. him. You had to go with him in that situation, right? Lendell, Lendell was carrying the load. He yeah. was literally, he, was, he, he carried all of us. The team, Reggie, the quarterback, all of us were, you know, and, and Lendell averaged like a ridiculous average per carry that game. Um, and, and and he hadn't fallen backwards the entire game up until that point. Um, they just had a perfect line stunt, you know. They had a perfect stunt for that for that call. And that's when you just got to go, hey, man, these guys are – these guys are uh, college football players too. They're the, you know, arguably – the number one, number two team in the nation, just like we are. Um, they got some players who are going to play at the next level, just like we are. Mm-hmm. They're they're on full scholarship, just like we are. You know, it's like hey, they made plays when they needed to, and and that's essentially that's really all it came down to was in that instant they ex- they out executed us in that moment. Right. So my hats off to those guys for sure. And you know, looking back on it now, I know it's it's still painful for you. And and you know, obviously, I had nothing to do with it. I was in middle school when this game was played, but I was uh, you know really sad because I wanted that three peat. You know, I, I love that team, and I really wanted that. Looking back on it now, I mean, some time has passed. It's one of the the greatest games in the history of college football. It's you know the the best two teams. All the impact players are making an impact in the game. Is there a little bit of you that says you know look we, th- something great happened that night? Yeah, we didn't get the win, but, you know, looking back on it, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, will you be able to say, you know what, there really was no loser to that game. It was just a great game, and we happened uh, to come out on the wrong end. Hmm. Let me think. I think um, as mature as I am now, Mm -hmm. I'm 32 years old. That game was, uh, what is it, 10 years now? 10 years, yep. 10 years ago. I don't think I've matured enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's why I said tw- that's why I said twenty or thirty years. Maybe the 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 sixty two year old version of you will be able to say that. At this stage in my my development, I can't <laughs> think of the one good thing out of that, um, with exception to us gaining a little bit of uh, perspective, a little bit of humility. And also uh, just appreciation for um, the, the continued support for even after uh, after we weren't successful that game. You know, the Trojan Nation definitely stood up. A lot of people were heartbroken, um, and, and honestly, it was it was a really sad moment. Um, that the atmosphere in the locker room was so somber. Uh, many of us wept. I was probably the second or third person in the locker room, it was the first and only time in my entire career that I did not go across the field and shake the opponent's hand. Um, And if I could, I would definitely have, I would have crushed my way across the field and shaken Ben Young's hand, uh, as well as uh, Michael Huff, because I thought he played a standout game. Um, as well as, a, and, and you know, they, they also had, um, as a running back, so good, Charles, um, I can't remember, his name is escaping me right now. Jamal Charles? Jamal Charles, I believe yeah. his name was, yeah. yeah. And then uh, they had another, they had another great running back, too. They had great running backs. Well, very comparable to, to our weapons that we had. Um, so, so, yeah, um... I don't know that there's anything particularly great about it besides uh, just understanding that just because you just because you work hard, play your hardest, and believe that you're going to be successful, um, that was the, probably the number one takeaway as a young man that I could take away from it. Um, in that moment, I fully understood that hard work and preparation was the bare minimum that you could do. Uh, to achieve any moderate level of success. And just because you worked hard at it didn't mean it was promised to you. Mm-hmm. Um, you had to have, there were some other factors. There's, there's, there's a lot of other factors that come into play when it comes to being successful and then obtaining victory. 
Mm-hmm. And um, it was it was kind of a, a small epiphany for me, you know, being a senior and, and realizing that, you know, wow, it, it didn't happen. We, we lost. We really lost. It's over. It's not. It's done. I'm never going to wear this uniform again with these guys. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> so that was a really surreal uh, realization for me. Um, it's probably, you know, I actually have that pit in, in the feeling of my stomach right now. Um, the same feeling that I had when I left the field. I left that game with a severe high ankle tear um, that hindered me all throughout even my rookie year and, and into the NFL. So I can just remember feeling so helpless on the sideline when Vince Young ran to my side of the field and we had Kevin Thomas out there who hadn't played a down, essentially a down of defense the whole game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know, it was terrible that he got put in that situation as a true freshman. Mm-hmm. Um, Vince Young, of all things, in the national right. championship game, being essentially cold, you know, and in the Rose Bowl. You know, that's, right. that's a tough game for anybody. And the running back you were thinking about was Selvin Young. Selvin Young, yeah, that, thank you very much. He's, he's very good. He's they, the, were, they were good, yeah, man. They yeah. were good. He's the one who scored on that play you were talking about, that lateral. And That's he, right. he's the one who scored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's coming back to me now. I don't. I don't follow much football. You know, I, I follow a lot of MMA because that's the sport I cover. And there's so much MMA. I don't. But I remember these teams because you know I was a kid when this was happening. So I, re- I remember uh, some of this stuff. It's all coming back to me now. So after USC, you graduate from there. You go to the NFL. I'm just curious because you were an undrafted rookie coming out of college. Um, because when you're an undrafted rookie and the draft's over, uh, it's kind of like you're back in high school again. You know, you field some offers and you look at what the best situation is. Okay, what scheme do they run? And, you know, who do they have? You know, what's the best opportunity for me to make a team? I'm just yeah. curious, what offers were on the table and why did you decide to go with Houston? Um, I'll be honest. Um, my agent my agents told me that there were a lot of guys that expressed interest um, from the Buccaneers to the Falcons, the Seahawks, um, I believe the 49ers, the Raiders, and, you know, all of the California teams were, were interested. Uh, for, I think for obvious reasons, I was pretty local. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I had interest from several teams, you know, that I could remember. But here's what happened at the Combine. Um, I could remember... The, uh, the defensive back coach for the Houston Texans, whose name was John Hoke. Um, at the time, I didn't, I wasn't unfamiliar with him, but of course, he later became my coach, so we got to know each other very well, mm-hmm. and I really had a lot of great, great respect for him, um, you, you know, even to this day. But he, as well as another, as another individual from the Texans organization, um, I just finished an interview with, um, uh, Nick Saban uh, and the Dolphins mm-hmm. and he put me through like a almost an hour long interview process uh, and it was great um, I thought I was very prepared for it I thought it was really well and I think Miami had they had high interest in me uh, because of my size and speed but the problem was I was coming off that ankle so I you know I didn't run fast at the combine um, not at all I think I ran maybe a 4.7 when um when I was a four three guy mm-hmm. on on an easy day, you know. Right. Um, so the Houston Texans and Coach Coach Hope they said, Hey man, um, you know, we were checking you out and I just wanted to ask you something. Um we you know, we're looking at you. You're definitely somebody we have a, a unique interest in. Uh you're you're you they told me that they were there was kind of an enigmatic uh, quality about what I brought, and, and I didn't really understand that term at the time. I later had to had to look it up. <laughs> I was like, I hope that's a good thing. It right. matters. Um, but I think it was, there was a question like, hey, what type of player is this? He only had one year of football that we can see worth of film, and mm-hmm. and then he got hurt, and then he came back in the championship game, and then he got hurt again. So like, what type of guy is he? But you know, they they said if we. If we, for whatever reason, if it doesn't work out where we draft you, would you be interested in in uh, competing and, and performing for our franchise? And I looked him dead in his eye. I shook his hand and I said, "I said it would be one of my life's greatest honors to play for the Houston Texans, mm-hmm. uh, Coach Hoke, and and I um I would be more than honored to, to have that opportunity." So. Obviously, 
actually it does with me thinking that, yeah, I'm going to get drafted by somebody, you know, you know, but that was an honorable thing to say for him and it's an honorable thing for me to say. So, fast forward now, uh, you know, a month and a half, two months later, you know, draft, draft happens, which is actually on my birthday. So my entire family was at my house and, and I go undrafted. The draft closes. And within literally 20 seconds of the, the the draft ending, you know, my mom walks over to me to try to give me a hug, and then my phone buzzes. Mm-hmm. It's a funny number I've never seen before, and it, it, it's John Hulk. Mm. It's, it's the same coach. I see. And he says, hey, John Walker. And I said, yes, this is he. He said, my name is uh, Coach John Hulk. Um, we met at, in Indianapolis. And I said, yes, I remember you. I remember you well. He said, do you remember what I asked you? Do you remember our conversation? I said, I most certainly do. He said, I would like to know if you're willing to honor the conversation that we had. Unfortunately, we ended up going with, uh, what did he say? We ended up going with a fullback and a tight end uh, in the f- fourth and fifth rounds. And that's where we, you know, that's where we had hopes to pick you up at. Um, he said, but, you know, I'm, I'm extending this offer right now. We would love to invite you into training camp and have you compete for our ball club. Mm-hmm. And I said, as I said in Indianapolis, I would be honored mm-hmm. to, yeah, most definitely. I didn't even consider who was on the team. I didn't care who was on mm-hmm. the team. I just knew that I had an opportunity to live my dream. Um, in a place that wasn't too far from home. It wasn't too foreign from what I was accustomed to from a cultural and climate standpoint. Mm-hmm. And um, and I knew it was a young team. Um, right. Obviously, you know, I, I'm a fan of football, so I had a general idea of what the roster looked like. And I knew I was going to have some great role models to be around. So that, that really influenced me. And, uh, and, and I, a week later, um, I flew out to Houston, I trained with the team, got acquainted with everyone, you know, really OTAs did their thing, and and, uh, and I think I excelled. I think I really, really excelled. I was still injured, by the way. I still had the high ankle that I was still nursing. Um, that ankle injury was really severe. It was really bad. Um, and it kind of hobbled me for, I would call it, close to six, seven months. <clears throat> so they, they essentially uh, practice squatted me. To, to continue to get me some further development. By the end of the season, I was activated and I was doing really well. Um, but I can remember once I got a little healthier, right when, uh, right before the preseason ended, um, the coaches had us run, and it was fun. It was funny because you know, in the locker, in the meeting room, rather, coach says, uh, <laughs> in our DB room, he says, "Which one of you DBs?" Um, you guys are supposed to be the fastest guys on the team. Um, I want to know uh, which one of you guys ran a 4-3 in the 40. Mm-hmm. And uh, one guy raised his hand. It was Dominic Robinson. And he goes, okay, okay, so you're the fastest guy. Well, who ran a 4-4? And then, like, five or six other DBs raised their hand. All right, cool. Then he goes, who ran a 4-6? <laughs> or a 4-5? Another guy raises his hand. Who ran a 4-6? You know, no one raises their hand. Then he says, <laughs> and I haven't raised my hand yet. Right. And essentially, that should have been the whole room. And then he goes, "Should I even say who ran a four seven? And then he said, "Anybody in here run a four seven at the combine?" And I raised my hand, and everybody looks back at me, and they're like, "Wow, buddy, how did you make it here?" <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you, you should be in the linebacker room, you know, like they were jokes. <laughs> and he said, "Okay, so all you guys who ran four, four, five, and under, you guys are going to work at Gunner." Anybody mm. runs <laughs> slower than that, you guys are going to work at wing for punt return mm. and uh, punt, and punt kickoff. I was like, okay, that's no problem. So we get out there and we all have to do like sprints for conditioning. Man, I finally had a healthy ankle. Man, I got out there and was flying. I was besides Andre Johnson. I think it was myself, Andre Johnson, and Dominic Robinson. We were leading every sprint. And, I, and uh, I went on to cover 13 kickoffs that practice and make nine tackles out of the 13 that I covered and assisted on another one. So I had 10 total tackles out of 13, and I didn't take a single break. Um, I took every single rep that I could in that 110-degree sun, and I beat everybody down the field to make the plays. And uh, I think that was one of the really pivotal moments. 
moment in me solidifying my spot on that team. The next step in your football career, I'm very curious to know about because I was a really, really, really big fan of NFL Europe. I know when when you got there, they changed the name to NFL Europa, but I still call it NFL Europe. But uh, I really loved all those teams uh, that were in that league, and I loved the whole development thing they had going on there where they'd have guys allocated from different teams and then they'd form a team and and play the games to get some guys experience and the team that you played on the Hamburg Sea Devils not only won the World Bowl and and if you you don't know what that means uh, for the people at home the World Bowl is the equivalent to the Super Bowl that's the championship game for NFL Europe it's called the World Bowl your team not only won that game, but was also the last team ever to win the World Bowl because the NFL shut it down. They, they ceased operations after that season. I'm just curious, what was that experience like? That was one of one of the most um, rewarding football experiences of my life. Um, it was the first. It was the first time uh, since high school that I actually finished the full season. Mm. Um, of of actually being a starter and and being able to be a really active and contributing factor on my team. So for me, that was huge. Uh, it was not only a, an opportunity to experience a different culture and and to travel and see a part of the world that I only dreamt of, um, but it was fresh off of my life and and, and our honeymoon. So. It was amazing. We essentially we honeymooned in Europe for six months or, or so, however long the season okay. was. I forget, maybe four, four and a half months or so. But it was it was a beautiful experience. Plus, the football was extremely um, comparable to that of what what I was competing with with the NFL, mm-hmm. the traditional NFL here in the states. So the level of talent was just the same. Um, it was basically a bunch of college all Americans who were in the same or similar position as me. Right. Um, just needed a little more experience, needed a little, needed a little more priming. Um, and, and, and then I discovered some really amazing athletes down there, and particularly one that stands out is Brett Grimes. He was one of my teammates. <laughs> and everyone, if you follow football, you guys can see you know how amazing of a career he's having. He's a pro bowler mm-hmm. um, now, and, and he was just one of the guys that worked his butt, butt off, and he was on the practice squad in NFL Europe where he finally gets activated because he's practicing so well, and then he becomes a stud and goes on to be a starter with the Miami Dolphins, the Atlanta Falcons, and, and, and now he's, he's somewhere else, but he's, he's demanding a very high salary for his abilities. What does a World Bowl ring look like? I've heard it's a very, very nice piece of jewelry. What does that look like? It, you know what? It's not as flashy as a, as a uh, NFL right. Super Bowl ring, right. um, but it is very comparable to like a uh, uh, NCAA championship ring. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the better rings of my collection. Um, it's in the it's in the shape of a football uh, with with our team colors, and it's got diamonds encrusted all around the shape and the perimeter of the football. I think in the middle it says NFL Europa, mm-hmm. um, and the year or which which uh, which season it was. But it just looks very nice. It's very clean and classy, and it's made out of out of white gold. Jack McNell was supposed to be your coach for that season, but he had some health issues and he had to step down. And then in steps Vince Martino. He becomes the coach, and he had no coaching experience, and he wins the World Bowl the first time he's a head coach. He'd been an O-line coach, an O-coordinator, but never a head coach. Then he steps in and he becomes the head coach, and you guys win the championship. Just curious, what was it like playing for him? How about that, right? You know right. what? He really reminded me of Norm Chow. Okay. Have very similar spirits and energy. They're very, very polite and um, mannerable coaches, and, and they you can tell the authenticity and the genuine uh, approach that they have with their players and their athletes. They have a, they, 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 those types of coaches, particularly Coach Chow, um, and, 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 you know, Coach Vince obviously as well, they lead with the love and the rapport. It's like, hey guys, I'm gonna respect you like the men that you are. So please don't disrespect myself or my staff or anybody here that's a part of this journey to help us be successful. Mm-hmm. And because he gave us that level of, like, uh, admiration and and that level of trust through, through respect you can't help but play balls out for a guy like that right um 
and you're gonna get the response. You don't you don't have to be like you know a Mr. Mr. Grinch type of coach, right? To, and, and you know prove how tough you are. Honestly, we were already motivated to work hard because we were there. Mm -hmm. If we weren't if we weren't motivated to do something special, none of us would have made that trip all the way across the world. Mm -hmm. He seems like a, a really nice guy. Obviously, I don't know him, never contacted him or anything, but uh, he seems like a really nice guy because I remember the, the Kenny Kern show. It's like a little web yeah. web thing. He was in there, and they were asking him something about Teo Johnson, and then he, he just blows up at him. He seems to have a, a really fun personality, that guy. I love that video. I think right before the World Bowl, you come in, you're, you're wearing a jersey, you're wearing like a, all kinds of clothing, I, I don't know why, and then you have your shoes are spatted up, and then you're wearing gloves, and, you're, and they're like, what are you doing, you know, where are you going, and you're like, oh, I'm just going to breakfast. <laughs> I wonder if that's still on YouTube. I'll have to look that up later. I, I haven't seen it in a very long time, but I'm sure it's still up there. I will tell you that that actually was not me. It looked just like me, though, because even in the video, when I saw it, I thought it was me. I was like, when did I do that? Ah. But actually, it was our linebacker. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. I think his name was Bo. I'm trying to remember our linebacker. He was our middle linebacker. And that's who it was. Uh, pretending to be me, but oh. we, we actually resemble one another. Okay, okay, okay. I'll have to try to dig that up and, and see. Yeah. But but I remember it was a, a very funny video. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He kind of special, man. He had a special talent for uh, for uh, comedy and, and um, yeah. very creative at, at building r rapport and team bonding exercises. So yeah. he's, he's a real special dude. Yeah, yeah. And you got to be that way. You know, this is a, a short season and guys from all over that have never played together. I mean, obviously, you had a little bit of an easier transition because you were reunited with Justin Wyatt. So it was a little bit, I guess, easier for you. And, and I think you had some Texans teammates on there as well, guys. guys I did. I had, I had uh, two Texans teammates as well, yeah. yeah. And Justin Wyatt, to this day, is still one of my best friends. Uh, love that man, Jay Wyatt. Yeah, I think he just finished law school. Mm. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Just curious, I missed this question a little bit earlier, but at that time when you were at USC, who did you hang out with and who are you still in contact with? I know you just said Wyatt. But... Uh, you know, the guys that I love in college are the guys that I still love and, and fellowship with today. My very best friend is Will, Will, William Buchanan. Mm -hmm. um, he's Buck. Buck. That's, uh, he, was, he was a receiver at DB. We were roommates from day one. Um, honestly, best friends to this day. He's the, he's the godfather to my children and, and vice versa. Um, with his, uh, I was very close with Jason Leach, who was a, a, like kind of the leader of our secondary after Troy left. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, I'm close with Justin Wyatt, Darnell Bean, uh, Dominic Bird. I still keep in touch with Lindell. Um, uh, gosh, you know what? I can actually go on and on and on. Actually, okay. you know, I don't, I don't get to fellowship with those guys as right. frequently. But um, Andre Woodard is definitely one of my my brothers, and we're we're essentially the guys that kind of stay connected and keep in touch with one another. Um, mainly, mainly a lot of guys that play within the secondary mm. uh, right. for obvious reasons. You know, right. we were a high core unit. <clears throat> but um, you know, the only person that I, I wish I had better contact with is is the president. Man, I wish I wish Reggie uh, and I were still as close as we once were. Mm. in college but for obvious reasons i understand why he has felt like he needed to create a little distance but i do miss him i miss him like uh, no one no one could believe because reggie's a wonderful person mm. now after you get done playing for the sea devils you go back to the houston texans i'm just curious because that was the last time you played for them what ended your run with those guys 
that um, it was just a number situation. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they drafted another, they drafted, uh, I think, Brandon Harrison from uh, uh, Stanford. I want to say he was free safety from Stanford that just moved me to free safety. Um, so I was a free safety guy as well. And it was really more of a, hey, you know, with Jay Walk, we love what you do, we love what you bring, but we need to bring in two new offensive linemen because one guy retired and another guy got injured. And so the depth was a little shaky, and, and Coach QB had let me know that it was more of a number situation mm-hmm. uh, and it wasn't a lack of ability or talent, mm-hmm. which was, you know, which was obviously really encouraging to hear, you know, because I felt like I was just coming into my own as a professional. I just had a lot of momentum coming out of NFL Europe, and and I was ready to go. I mean, I was ready to really, uh, really, really live that dream and, and be a contributing player on my team, you know. But hey, you know, God has other plans. I've always had a uh, a ability to um, bounce back from things and, and to be resilient. And um, beyond that, I also was already working on my career as a coach. Believe it or not, even when I was work, when I was playing for the Houston Texans, I was working a part time job at Twenty Four Hour Fitness. Mm. Oh. So I was always a coach. I've been a coach since I was fifteen years old, mm. and and you know this is what I always knew I was going to be, no matter what. Mm. So okay. I am living my dream each and every day. Then from the Houston Texans, you join Arena Football. You join the AFL. You get signed by the New York Dragons. You're too humble and you're too modest to say it, but I'll say it for you. You got robbed. You should have been Defensive Rookie of the Year. You had a great year that year. Nine interceptions, eight forced fumbles, I think 15 passes broken up, uh, three defensive returns for touchdowns. What was that experience like playing in arena football? Oh, man, well, thank you so much for for that. I, I appreciate you. You saying that um, I felt that way too at the time, but um, hey, what, what for me is going to be for me. You know, it's, it's, it's meant, it's meant, it's not, it's not. Right. But I will tell you this, and I will, and I will state state this very loud and clear. I was so reluctant to play in the Arena Football League. Mm-hmm. I did not want any part of it. And no disrespect to those players, but this is just please charge this to my my lack of education in the area and me just being a little bit of a, I think at that time I was kind of arrogant. But I did not want to play in an undisciplined league with a bunch of guys who couldn't play in the NFL. Right. That's, the, that's the foolish lie that I told myself when my agent who uh, presented the opportunity to me. But I will say this, that the Arena Football League experience was the single most greatest, most fun experience I've ever had at playing professional sports. It was the creme de la creme for me. Mm-hmm. I loved every second of it. I loved my teammates. I loved the style of play. I love my coaches. I love the fans and how they can interact with you so intimately. I love every part of the Arena Football League. And boy, oh boy, if I could still play today, I would. I really would. That was the most single most rewarding experience playing football, period. Uh, beyond that of uh, the USC experiences and the national titles. The uh, World Bowl Championship in Europe, my season with the NFL and the Houston Texans, um, AFL with the New York Dragons was hands down my fun, my funnest life experience playing playing sport. Mm-hmm. You only played one year for New York Dragons, then. You go away for two years, and then I believe in 2011, it's reported that you had signed with the Jacksonville Sharks. Just curious, why did you never play for those guys? I pulled my hamstrings the week before the opener. I uh, I pulled it. It was a grade two, a grade two pull, and uh, they told me it was a 15-week recovery. I said, what? Well, no, they said it was a 12- to 16-week recovery for me. I said, we went 12, that's the whole season. And essentially they're like, yeah, it is the whole season. Mm-hmm. So, um, the coach, the coach, uh, let I want to say, I think 
really good breakfast. And um, he, he asked me to come talk with him. And uh, he said, hey, buddy, I, I just want to let you know we appreciate everything you've done, everything that you brought, the, every, the energy. I think you, we think you're a heck of a football player. Um, but we need guys that can play right now. Mm-hmm. You know, we need dudes that can, we can actually use. And uh, it was very simple. You know, he, he just explained that it wasn't going to work because I was, hit, I was hurt. Mm-hmm. And I understood. I understood. So, you know, two days later, I was back to California. It's too bad because you could have added another ring to your collection because that year they won the Arena Bowl. Oh, yeah. We were good. Uh, we, were, we were really good in package and it was competitive. Um, but I was, yeah, definitely feeling well out there as well. I, I didn't miss a beat. I left from, from the, the, the two years off. It was because the league folded, you know, mm-hmm. the NFL folded, which right, was really right. terrible because I thought I was really going to lay a foundation in the NFL. I was ready to, like, fully commit to it. And then my next year's contract was going to be huge, actually, because of how I performed my rookie year. The coach actually renegotiated my whole contract, and it was going to be an awesome opportunity for my wife. And, and, uh, and my, you know, at the time, my wife said she was, she was pregnant. So I was like, man, we're going to have a baby. This is cool. This is good. You know, I'm going to make some money. But then the league sold it. So I wanted to get back into it, um, but then my hamstring pulled from, I guess, being off, and the only thing I've been doing was really kind of just MMA training during that whole two-year tenure, and I'd opened up my gym, um, but I wasn't, I guess I wasn't in the football shape that I needed to be in. Mm-hmm. I've heard you say that football, it shaped you into the man that you are today, but it hasn't always been kind to you. I, I've heard you say that in the past. You know, you you it, it wasn't nice to you. There were times that the sport did you wrong. I'm just curious, um, what exactly are you referring to? Is it just in general, or is there a certain time in your career? Um, you know, like overall, uh, from from start to finish, number one, first, I'm always going to pay homage homage to the sport that has opened up every doorway that I have today, um, including my education. And, and being able to get two degrees from USC, um, football has provided that opportunity for myself. It gave me my base, right? My base as an adult, who I was going to be once I was off on my own. You know, mom and dad can't take care of you forever. So I will always be grateful and indebted to football for that, for that platform that it, it has given me now. Um, so please don't get me wrong, but I'm also a person that's very honest. Football was hard for me. I didn't really, I didn't really play football until like my junior year in high school. I was, I was on my JV like team, um, but I was practicing with the varsity players, so I didn't really get to play that much JV mm-hmm. football. And my first real, real year of experience was uh, in eleventh grade, so I was really kind of behind the eight ball, and always my learning curve had, had accelerated because I had no football IQ. True story, I didn't know what a linebacker was until I got to college. Mm. Really? I had, I, that's a true story. Um, I knew, um, I kind of knew, like, oh, what were the dudes that stand behind the linemen who hands are on the ground? Like, my football IQ was not very high at all when I got to USC, and it was something that I wasn't, I wasn't ever really uh, focused on because I just know my high school system enough to play well. Mm. And um, and then with my natural athletic ability, it was always an easy matchup. You know, just, hey, don't let, don't let number 13 catch the ball. We're going to be in this coverage. You do your thing. Right. All right, cool. Hey, Joe, this is your route. Go do your thing. All right, all right cool. I thought all of football was like that. Right. <laughs> right. Going to college. But when I got to USC, it was a rude awakening. So where I exceeded in athletic ability and playmaking ability, I greatly lacked in overall football IQ and knowledge. Mm. Um, and then also physicality, because I wasn't the biggest kid either. So mm. football was hard on me in the sense that <clears throat> I always knew that I was a lot more physically capable than a lot of the guys that I saw excelling before me. Mm. Um, but it was it was always a longer, you know, kind of tougher road mm-hmm. for me as an individual because the coaches always had that stigma. At least I felt like that. I always had that stigma like, yeah, but he's so raw. He just doesn't, he right. hasn't had enough reps. He hasn't had enough experience yet. Yet, 
to the practice from Dead and Lie, and media at the time used to always ask, why isn't that guy out there? We see right. him killing in practice. He's he's playing two positions. He's 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 catching every ball. He's scoring in practice. He's you know, he's going down covering kicks. He's he's, he's everywhere. Walker's everywhere. Not only that, but he's great with the fans, and he's finding everything for the kids, and he's just a great person. Why isn't that dude out there on the field? And it, for me, it was never fully articulated why I, I wasn't getting that opportunity. The only thing Coach Shaw would, would consistently say was, we just got too many guys. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. rightfully so, John Walker does deserve to play. But how can I take this guy off the field who hasn't done a single thing wrong, who's right. playing well within the system, doing well within the scheme? How can I just take him off the field to put Jay Walker in? You know, it's kind of just one of those things where we have so much depth right. and talent. You know, it's going to be like anybody that they inserted in, into any position at USC was going to excel. Right. But it's that way. Right, right. That was it. We were just that good. Right, right. And there's no mistakes being made because you're blowing out everybody. I mean, yeah, there's some close games here and there, but a lot of these scores are really, really one-sided to, to your team's uh, side of the field. So that's very interesting. You know, you, you came into to USC, a place where, you know, Pete Carroll had been in the NFL. You come into, like, a, a pro system, and you don't really know a whole lot about football. Your your football IQ at that time was 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 not very minimal, very minimal. And on top of that, you know, it's it's also one of those situations where it's like Coach Carroll didn't recruit me. Right. Um, I was actually the first recruit of the of Coach Hackett's uh, the coaching staff before him. I was the first cr- recruit of that in twenty two thousand one. Mm. I was the first finding of the two thousand one. Uh, um, recruiting class, mm-hmm. from what I remember reading. Um, so, and Coach Packett was very high on me. And the defensive back coach, who at the time name was Dennis Thurman, he adored me as an athlete, and he knew of my lack of football IQ. Mm-hmm. And he talked to my mom personally and said, I know that this is a kid that's just like an open book. And whatever we write in there is what he's going to become. He is fast. He's going to get bigger. He wants to hit guys. He catches everything. And he strips the ball. He makes plays on the football. So he plays football like someone that doesn't know the rules, which is great. Mm-hmm. Because he plays the way he he creates situations. And that's what I can remember them saying, why they liked me as an athlete coming out of, uh, coming out of high school. Because they're like, this is a dude that just like, he's not confined by what people say he's supposed to do. He just plays it with a free spirit, which is something we can cultivate. And man, then that staff got fired. Coach Kelly came in. I was worried because I didn't know the guy beyond uh, just what I saw with him with the Patriots. And the only thing that he, he, he called my mom and said, hey, I seen film on John Walker. He looks like the talent level of the type of player that I would recruit and obviously obviously we would love for him to honor his commitment and he's definitely a kid that we would recruit you know by my standard he's like a four four and a half star type of player Mm -hmm. and that's what we're looking for here we're building something new but everything I read about him just says he's a wonderful person and I think that's the most important thing I need guys like him that I can build a foundation with and teach these new generation of athletes that we're going to recruit the right way, our way, the Trojan way. I would never forget those quotes. And he goes, Jay Walk, you're here to teach people to do things the right way, our way, the Trojan way. And I bought in, and I said, okay, that's my job. I'm going to show everybody the right way. I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm going to teach everyone the best way I can. I'm going to open up my apartment to the guys who don't have a place to live. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I budget my money and make sure i got enough food for everyone if they're hungry. And that was my thing, man. I kept, when guys are hungry, I'm like, hey, man, come on over. I got some extra ramen noodles and macaroni and cheese. I got some rice right, and roni. Right. <laughs> Hey, we can do it, man. We can party. We can make this work. Right. And I bought four couches and put them in my living room for beds for guys to, if they didn't have a place to stay for summer or whatever the case may be. Um, and that was it, man. Every, and my, my apartment was, everyone lived there. You know, Reggie lived with me for a time. Uh, uh, Lindell, um, Dominic Bird lived with me for a time. 
just kind of that was my role, you know. And, and so then I just became the nice guy on the team that you know everyone started to look up to. But the coaches never saw me as like that's the guy we need to feature mm-hmm. and get him and use his abilities and, and, and let's use those tools. Right. I just that's why I said, man, it was hard to see that right. to see guys that I can whoop in practice just out there shining on, and I'm like, oh my God, I played against these dudes in high school. I mean, to the guys that are, you know, were, you know, from other schools like Cal and and ASU. I was like, I've been playing against that dude since we were in high school. I right. can kill him. Let me right. on the field, please. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but it just, you know, it didn't happen until my senior year. Right. Good stuff, good stuff. John, I've been following your career from USC to Houston Texans to Hamburg Sea Devils to New York Dragons, and now, absolutely, I'm going to be keeping an eye on you now that you're working in the sport that I cover, so I'm definitely going to going to keep an eye out for you. And this was an absolute honor and a privilege to talk to you. I've been following you for a very long time, so thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you so much, man. I'm so humbled by this opportunity, and, and may, may, may the Lord continue to bless you and your path and your endeavors, and you can call me anytime, my friend, and for all you listeners out there, you guys make sure you please support support this gentleman. He's hardworking, he's got a lot of integrity, and uh, let's, let's help elevate, elevate his career and, and, and everything that he's got his hands tied into. And you guys all have a wonderful and blessed uh, rest of this year.